Hi, thanks for your interest in Roman Roads Media. We're wrapping up our first course, The Grammar of Poetry by Matt Whitley, and we're very excited for its upcoming release. I'd like to show you a little sneak peek of the course. The first thing you'll see in the, is the DVD intro and menu, and this will be followed by some samples taken from various lessons. We hope this course is the first of many, so stay tuned. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and you'll find us at romanroadsmedia.com, where we won't only be selling the DVD, but also a cloud-based version of the course. Thanks for watching. Of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world, and all our woe with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us, and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse. to review what we've learned about scanning poetry and so let's, uh, let's take a moment and review those things right now remember that when you're scanning poetry you're dealing with syllables a syllable is the smallest piece of a line of poetry each syllable is either accented or it's unaccented if it's accented it receives a stress if it's unaccented it receives a breathe once you put in your stresses and your breathes you look for patterns and you put foot boundaries around your patterns and we know two different types of patterns, or two different foot types that we've covered so far. One is iambic feet, and the second is trochaic feet. Um, and we'll learn another one um, here shortly, but right now we just know two. That means that you have a full rhyme. Ing and ing match each other perfectly. Again, the spelling is not what we're looking for, and that's a common uh, pitfall, is for students to think, well, they're spelled the same, therefore they must rhyme. Or they're spelled differently, and therefore they must not rhyme. It does not have to do with spelling, which is a relief to some of us, right? It all has to do with how the words sound. Let's look at this different example. Full rhyme produces a clean and predictable effect. Okay, it's the sort of thing that Dr. Seuss uses, right? You just know what's going to come next. You can anticipate what's going to happen next, and everything falls into place. And for a very, very young child, you know, three-year-old or a four-year-old that you're reading a story to, they can anticipate and there are no surprises and everything's happy all the day long. This is full rhyme. It's an exact match at the end of the word. The, the second kind of rhyme... That all right, welcome to Riddle Rendezvous. Throughout the course, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a riddle to you. You're going to have to figure it out on your own. Some of these riddles come from popular literature, from folklore. Squeeze it and it cries tears as red as its flesh, but its heart is made of stone. I'll just give you the answer for this one. It's me. And again, this is the basics. If you can read through a poem or a nursery rhyme like this and figure out where those stresses should be. Did you hear that? Where those stresses should be, then you'll have... So one of the challenging things for some people is to find to actually find the sound that they're looking for because it, all of the spelling is phonetic as well. So for the word goat, what I would do is simply go to the beginning of the book. These are all of the one-syllable rhymes. And, um, and look up the sound O-T or oat. Um, so it looks like a long O followed by a T. A pun may also be called a play on words. Okay, and so we'll, um, we'll call them puns. In this, um, in this lesson, but what you're doing is you're playing on the fact that there are two words that are so sim similar to each other. They might be the same word and have different definitions, or they might be almost the same word, and you're trying to play upon, you know, it's almost like you have twins. And imagine if you had a twin, and then the second definition was Adam was naive or gullible or easily fooled. And another example here, a little bit longer, so it's a conversation between two people, between Lance, Sir Lancelot, and Merlin. It says, Lance says, did you hear that all of the members of King Arthur's Round Table have insomnia? It means they cannot sleep in the evenings. Merlin says, wow, that's what I call having a lot of sleepless nights. 
Okay, and so look at that for a moment and ask yourself, okay, which word's being played upon that we can unpack and see the two definitions? It is knights. Okay, what are our two definitions? Number one is the way it's spelled. Okay, knights with armor on horses riding off to fight. And, of course, then if you, if you cut your K, knights, sleepless knights, unpacking the insomnia quote. I had a, when I was in college years ago, I took a class called M N E, and we're going to practice our scansion again because this is such an important skill to have down. It really is built in, and there's continuity throughout the next few lessons so that what we've learned when it comes to meter, you know, measuring a line of poetry, putting in our stresses, putting in our breathes, so that we don't lose those skills. And I want to really hone and develop those over the next few lessons. So let me review, first of all, what we've learned, and we basically just have three steps to scansion. Read the poem quietly to yourself. Figure out where you should bob your head. Number two, put in your stresses. Number three, put in all, you know, put in breathes over all of the rest of the vowel sounds that you see, all the rest of the syllables that are there. So here's a new example, one that we have. Belshazzar is king, Belshazzar is lord, and a thousand dark nobles all bend at his board. Fruits glisten, flowers bloom. I tear her tattered ensign down. Long has it waved on high, and many an eye has danced to see that banner in the sky. Beneath it rung the battle shout, and burst the cannon. The uh, Syrian came down like the wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Uh, all right, so let's look at this now. We have our stresses in. Look at this last line, when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Yes, there should be a stress right there. So we have our stresses in, and now we're going to place our briefs. The uh, Syrian came down like the wolf on the fold. And the first, let me just write this down, and I want you to see if you can identify what that is. If I show you that pattern and I say, okay, we have foot boundaries on either side, and it goes brief stress. Could you tell me what sort of foot that is? If I say, all right, let's reverse it, and I want to see stress breathe right there, label that one. Great hall called Hierat, and there's feasting and partying and singing going on in the hall, and there's a, uh, there's a monster named Grendel who lives in a cave in the sea, and he comes out and he hears the feasting and he hears the reveling, and he hates it, and he wants to put it to, a, to an end. And so he goes and he's creeping in and listen to hear the alliteration in this particular section. It says, When night had fallen, the fiend crept near. Ye wat tha neosian, sithan nik bikom. To the lofty hall to learn how the Danes, heon huses, who hit ring dene. In Hirot fared. After personification, we covered synecdoche, which is part for a whole, so all hands on deck. And then um, most recently, we covered the hyperbole which is an extravagant exaggeration. And so we're moving on to trope number seven, or uh, figure of speech number seven, and you can see that is a mouthful, and it's onomatopoeia. And the first thing that we need to be able to do is to say the word. Number one, a soda pop can being opened. Okay, and so you can think of the opening of the lid. Sometimes on an advertisement, they'll take a, a pop can, put it right to the microphone, and then and you can hear the bubbles coming out. Number two, coins being tossed into a glass. So you've got a, maybe a crystal glass and you drop some coins down into it. Number three, an egg hitting the sidewalk. Number four, two co um, For tetrameter, the, the thing to think through is a tetrarch. If you can remember in the, in the New Testament, um, Herod, the tetrarch who beheaded John the Baptist, um, a tetrarch is a ruler and he rules over a fourth of the kingdom. Herod, as the tetrarch, rules over one of those pieces. So that's four feet per line. Pentameter, these get into to simple geometric shapes that you might be familiar with. 
pentameter is of course five feet per line and so you can think of the pentagon if that's helpful for you five different pieces there there's a lot of poetry written in iambic pentameter very famous poetry scan the following anapestic poem then with that meter in your ear write your own poem using the same meter and again this is familiar territory right we've worked through the destruction of Sennacherib ourselves in our previous lesson um, but go ahead and take a moment read through this poem uh, or this stanza of the poem and see if you can figure out where to place your stress and we'll look at an example that a, a student did for me a few years ago and what they've done is the same music but their own content it says two kings with their armies marched into a valley their forces too many to and let's look at this because this is interesting to see when we scan this two kings with their armies marched into a valley their forces too many to count or to tally